And it is an interesting subject. I hope today that uh, as we go through this, you will at least come away with the knowledge and information of knowing what the Bible clearly says about what happens to you after you die. And if not, if not, then hopefully in addition, we can uh, perhaps have some questions that are generated in your minds and of which I would like to encourage all of you, that is uh, for later on in our Q&A session, that it, as I go through the course of this presentation, if indeed you do have some questions that may come up uh, in the um, unfolding of this topic, write them down so that we can go through them afterwards and have a little bit of interaction because that's certainly what we're hopeful for because it's very important that we come away from this meeting with clarity. You may not agree, some of you who may find this uh, information perhaps uh, rather new and uh, somewhat um, uh, different than what is normally taught in most traditional Christian denominations. Nevertheless, it still is very important that we make or at least let Scripture be the foundation of what we do come to terms with in our belief system. I think if we stick with the Scriptures, uh, certainly we'll all be safer in doing it that way and uh, it's hard to argue with uh, the Word of God that's for sure you can argue with me all day long but <laughs> with the Word of God it's a little bit uh, more different uh, in that respect all right if you all would um, turn with me over here to a very very popular and well-known scripture in the book of John chapter 3 and in verse 16. Many of you know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish or apelohe, apelohe. And he goes on, but have everlasting life. Now, this is interesting. I want to park here just for a minute because it's important. Oftentimes, we just, you know, kind of uh, through rot memory, just repeat this scripture, very popular scripture, very well known. Most Protestant denominations within the Christian uh, movement, evangelicals and so on, will just rattle this off without even thinking about it. I want to stop and think. Because there's a very important word here that oftentimes is overlooked, and that word is perish. And it is a dichotomy here. It is a distinction. It is a contrast between the words remaining there after that comma, but have everlasting life. What you're being presented here and what's being posed is a stipulation that you either die or you live. And it's interesting, apolome, the Greek word, simply means destruction. It means cessation. It means dead, <laughs> unplugged, not moving. <laughs> you are dead, to die, destroyed. That's what this word means. And interestingly enough, growing up and uh, being a former Methodist, as I was till I was about seven years old, and then my parents stopped taking me to church because they stopped and I didn't drive yet, the, uh, the fact was that it was interesting to see that upon studying my Bible as I got older, I came to find that there were certain things I was led to believe that were in the Bible that of all things were not in the Bible uniquely enough. And one of those things is the fact of having inherent immortality. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you were born with it. When you see that little baby come out of the womb and they're cleaning it all up, it's already immortal. It already has something in it that will not die. As a matter of fact, we're taught in most Christian denominations, and I want to pose this concept to you, because oftentimes we have not been trained to think this way. But it is a fact that when you die, you don't die. You don't. You change locations. <laughs> you either go to paradise, we know it in the Christian religion as heaven, or you go to a place called hell where you are eternally tormented forever and ever. 
Now in the Catholic Church they have a third location which is a holding cell called purgatory. And until God determines what to do with you or your relatives pay enough money to get you out on bond or bail, you're allowed then of course to go on wherever you're going to be going. Hopefully that is in heaven. But the fact of it is we are told that you don't die, that you actually disembody from your flesh upon death. You see it in the movies in Hollywood. And as a result of the body being dead, you're not. You're conscious. You're disembodied in a conscious state of which we're told from that point on we go someplace. We're in a different life form and we go someplace. And yet right here in John 3.16 we're in conflict right off the bat. Not to mention of course, and let me bring your attention over here to the book of Romans. To the book of Romans and in chapter 6 book of Romans chapter 6 we read this in verse 23, I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase for the sake of time. Uh, you can perhaps uh, put this in context uh, when you have a more convenient time to read the whole chapter. But essentially Paul is talking here about a very important subject in relationship to sin and grace. And as he comes down in conclusion of this portion and segment of Scripture, he kind of concludes with this. For the wages of sin is death. And then he contrasts that. Again, this is a stipulation. It is a distinction. It is a A and B. It's black and white. <laughs> it's, it's very fundamental, very clear. The wages of sin, death. And he says here, of course, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. And so we have this life and death relationship of telling us that if indeed we intend to continue in a sinful way, contrary to God's way, contrary to the values, standards, and laws of which He has laid down for us to abide by, if we intend and insist on doing that kind of a lifestyle to where that defines us, then guess what? You shall destruct. You shall perish. You shall aplo me. Aplo me. You shall die dead. S uh, you will desist. You will unplug. You will not move. You, you will be just totally like a computer. Dark screen. Black. Done. Over. Unplugged. And nothing can come up and nothing will go on. As a matter of fact, and, and we have to consider this. The Old Testament, and I, you know, a lot of us, we, we marginalize this fact, but the fact of it is, is the Old Testament is indeed the foundation of the early apostolic New Testament church. Frankly, it was the only scriptures they had available to them in that first century. There was no New Testament. Need to consider that. The New Testament was not written yet, so therefore, all of these scriptures in the Old Testament are indeed foundational to the New Testament apostolic church of that first century. These guys, guys like Peter and John, guys like Andrew, guys like Thomas and Matthew, Mark, Luke and others, Paul himself, all got their ideas, all were educated from these Old Testament scriptures. Three major primary categories, the writings, the prophets and the law. And so over here in Ezekiel, chapter 18, we read, and again, I'm just going to cut to the chase here one more time, just to keep driving this theme of where did Paul learn the idea that the wages of sin is death and that you, as a human being of all things, could die. Where did that come from? Right here. Look at this. Ezekiel 18. And we're going to come back to this word soul here in a moment. But in verse 4, we read, Behold, all souls are mine. And as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall live forever. It's going to die. He repeats this, the prophet does, over in verse 20, same chapter. He repeats it again. He says, the soul that sins, it shall indeed die. And so here we begin to see in these two, actually three, including John 3.16, portions of Scripture, it's very clear, both Old and New Testament, 
that the wages of sin is indeed death. That souls, and we're going to come back to this word in a moment, this soul, does indeed die. And basically what the Bible is telling you is that you are mortal. That you can be destroyed. And you can be killed, die, again, eliminated from life. And so as a result, we, in understanding that, should come to some kind of recognition that we are all under bondage to death. The Bible even claims that. Each and every one of us here in this room know, because we're alive, we're consciously aware that we're going to die. The living know they will die. The Bible claims that indeed you will. And as we saw here, it means just that, death. So where do we get this notion? Where, where do we get this idea that we live forever regardless of whether or not we obey God or whether or not we disobey God? Where did that notion come from? Let's go back here to the Bible again, way back in the beginning. Because there was an original lie that was mentioned right out of the gate. To Eve, over here, where Satan the devil, in his proposition, questions God, and in verse 4 of chapter 3 in the book of Genesis, states this. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now that may be an oversimplification because obviously that statement has taken on in the transition of time and over the centuries and over the millennia and over the cultures of mankind taken on different forms of how that's defined. And I hearken back to the Hellenistic movement. I hearken back to Plato and Socrates. I hearken back to all of these philosophers and the ancient mystery religions of Babylon and Egypt and the sun-worshipping uh, religions of so many other empires of the past that had come from this point onward that we could look back to to see how this simple statement you shall not surely die took on different definitions and was spun in such a way that it was palpable and believable by tens of millions if not billions of people coming to the conclusion that they have inherent immortality. Even Timothy Leary thought he had a spirit inside him waiting to be released. And that all he had to do was die because this flesh was a limitation on what his true maximum capability was. And there is some truth to that, but not in the concept that he had rolling around between his ears. Over here in Genesis 2, let me take you back to this. Because here is where we get initially introduced to this word soul in the Hebrew that comes from this Hebrew word called nephesh. And we read in verse 7 of chapter 2 in the book of Genesis, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living, immortal soul? It doesn't say, there's no adjective there. It just says nephesh. That is it. It is a Hebrew word that simply means air-breathing creature. I'm an air-breathing creature. And the, uh, the scriptures prove this. Go over here again, uh, just move your eyeballs to uh, verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he's going to call them. And whatsoever uh, Adam called every living creature that was named thereof. The word creature? Nephish. Same word. Translated in the English, creature. So if we take creature and we put it over there in verse 7, and man became a living creature. Makes more sense. Especially in light of Ezekiel 18, Romans 6, 23, and as you will see, some additional scriptures over here in Ecclesiastes. Let's go there for a moment. A book written by an ancient king of Israel, Solomon, known for his wisdom. Chapter 9 states this, and we've already kind of touched on this, but here's some scripture that substantiates the understanding that the living do indeed know they're going to die. 
Verse 5, chapter 9, book of Ecclesiastes. For the living know that they shall die. Yes, we do. As a matter of fact, we're in bondage to that thought. When I was 20 years old, I never thought about it. I was too busy thinking I was invincible. I was too busy uh, living my life. You know, I, I, was, I could get on a motorcycle, go 100 miles an hour, and never think it was going to flip on me or that because I was invincible. I was undestructible. I was 20 years old. I was King Kong, you know. Uh, in my own mind, I was a legend in between my own years. I had uh, all these kinds of things that, you know, it's not, never going to happen to me. I'll never fall off a cliff. I'll never get hit in the head with a baseball bat. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll live through anything and everything because I'm 25 years old. I'm filled with testosterone, you know. Well, guess what? I'm a little older now. I'm in bondage to death. <laughs> and the reality check of life tends to sneak up on you as you age. Some people call it mellowing. I call it maturing and realizing, you know what, we're just nothing but dust, dirt, and water, for, quite frankly. And here in Ecclesiastes, we're reminded about that. He says, but the dead, now listen to this, 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 this is really interesting. I do not know what the traditional Christian community does with these scriptures, but they're here. And we're going to read them. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. No matter how great you are, no matter how many people you ruled, no matter how powerful your empire was, and you were the king, it's great to be king. You know, a lot of kings were said, would say that. It's great to be king. But guess what? They died. And as time went on and the centuries passed and the dust began to heap up and bury their empires, their names were forgotten in history. Do you know, anybody know the kings of the Hittites? Anybody understand uh, all of the kings that came and went in the kingdom of Assyria? Or how about the Jebusites? Anybody know about the kings of the Jebusites? My point is made. They come and go, and yet these were very big empires, very big communities and civilizations. But here we're told also their love, their emotion. The dead lose their emotion. Why? They're dead. They're dead. They are at present in a pause mode. And we'll get to that here in a moment. He says their hatred, their envy is now, here's the uh, English word translated from the Hebrew, perished. Perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Why? Because who and what they are, what they accomplished, everything they aspired to, and everything that made them who they were, be it education, accomplishments in life, the aspirations that they fulfilled throughout their life, the course, the family, the kids, the grandkids, the great-grandkids, and all the things that they accumulated and died is now out of their control because they are no longer active. They have been deactivated. And consequently, everything that they are is what it is. They're done. Their story's written. And whatever their legacy is, it is what it is. So the only time we have available to us to change our legacies and to do things that are different, if indeed we're not satisfied with what we're doing, is now when you're plugged in <laughs> and the computer's rolling and, and everything's up on the screen and, and you can still move your cursor around and stuff and all those things. If you know what I'm talking about, I'm using metaphors here, but uh, you understand what I'm saying in regards to our life as human beings. But here again, he says um, uh, very clearly here that your life is, is finished for all intents and purposes when you die. He says here in verse 9, dropping down, same chapter, chapter 9, verse 9 now, book of Ecclesiastes, live joyfully with your wife whom you love all the days of your life of, uh, van of your vanity which he has given you under the sun all the days of your vanity for that is your portion in this life and in your labor which you take under the sun whatsoever your hand finds to do do it with all your might for there is no work not, nor device knowledge nor wisdom in the grave where you go. I went to a funeral this week. About, I think it was Tuesday. Took my seven-year-old grandson with me because it was a church member's father. And uh, we went to the funeral. And I walked up to the, uh, the casket where the body was displayed with my seven-year-old grandson. And uh, he is 
pretty well versed in the scriptures already and knows them fairly well like many of the young people here. And so we looked at the body and we talked a little bit about the fact of how this individual was indeed in a sleep condition. And I'm entering this into the conversation now. Why am I saying that? Because that's what Jesus characterized that death to be. He characterized it when he came to see Lazarus as sleep. The disciples were so confused about that terminology, they literally thought that Jesus was unnecessarily exposing his, himself to dangers that could have been avoided by just letting Lazarus sleep. Because <laughs> they thought he was asleep. But finally Jesus had to break it down and say, look, we've got to go, Lazarus is dead. Oh, and then they got it. But no one in their uh, Jewish mind ever heard of death being characterized as sleep. And yet, when you look at a body, admittedly, would you not say it looks as though he's asleep? I discovered my mother, when she died, on the couch with the television going, sitting up with her eyes closed and actually her head back. And I walked in the room thinking she was sleeping. As a matter of fact, Margie was with me, my wife, she was behind me and I said, Margie, look at her. She's sound asleep. And then she grabbed my arm. Margie did, my wife. She knew immediately that there was something strange about my mom at that time. But I got, I got schnookered. I thought she was really just sleeping. In, in all due respect to that uh, discovery. But in Ecclesiastes 3, we're told something very humbling, at least it should be, to all of us. And for those of us who are young, the sooner we come to this realization, the better off you will be, because it does put life in perspective and adds a, an element of realism to our actual physical condition and who we really are, lest we make decisions, uh, silly decisions and perhaps even stupid decisions about uh, ourselves with respect to our health and our safety. But at any rate, in verse 19 of chapter 3 of the book of Ecclesiastes, we read this, For that which befalls the sons of men befalls beasts. Even one thing befalls them as the one dies, so dies the other. In this particular case, whether you see a dead dog, a dead cat, a dead, de a dead deer, a, a, a dead rodent of some sort, a dead bird, whatever, in that sense, death to death is the same. It's the same. Everybody is deceased, <laughs> unplugged. They are now, at this point, inactive, deactivated. That bird's not going to fly anymore. That rodent's not going to dig up my yard anymore. You know, the, the things that go on in our minds, is death to death is simply equal in that regard. And what the writer here, what Solomon is essentially trying to self-actualize for us, is that particular case, that one dies, so does the other, Yea, they all have one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast for all's vanity in that respect. Keep it in context. He's not talking about the human potential compared to an animal. Let's make that distinction. What he's just talking about, stay focused. He's just talking about death to death. Death is the same for uh, living organisms in that regard. It could be a worm, for that matter, you know, a mosquito. <laughs> it could be a beetle or, or any kind of a bug for that uh, uh, sake. But at any rate, that's what he's driving at. Verse 20, all go unto one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. And we're reminded about that again in Genesis over there in the beginning, uh, almost from the get-go, that indeed we are dust. That dust we are, dust we shall return. Many of you are familiar with those kinds of uh, scriptures and innuendo that are, are placed throughout the Bible. I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but in... Um, Ecclesiastes, uh, well, let me just finish this, uh, yeah, uh, verse 20, I already read that. All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. So this is very, uh, what you could say, uh, revealing, at least it should be, to, to many of us in regards to this self-actualized value that we have as a living organism. We're told in Genesis 3.19, I referenced it, that dust we are and dust we shall return. In Psalms 146 verse 4, I'm not turning there, you can uh, read it later. 
But basically it says that your thoughts perish. Your thoughts perish. That correlates with Ecclesiastes over there in verse 9 where it says love, emotion, hatred, envy, all of those things. Guess what? A selfish, no good scoundrel, when he's dead, no longer has any effect or impact on those around him anymore. When Hitler died, it was over in that regard. Because guess what? With him, all his hatred, all of his bias, all of his prejudice, all of his racism, all of everything that defined him as a human being deactivated at that point. Same thing with Jeffrey Dahmer. Same thing with my dad and my mom. In that respect, even Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes says he was mad. He was mad that the noble and the evil all have the same bondage. We're all bound to death. <laughs> he felt that was kind of unfair. He thought, if you're a good person, you ought to be able to get out from underneath that bondage. Well, guess what? The good news is, you can. You can. But, that's another story here. We'll get to it as we get uh, to, uh, to that point. But in Psalms 115, get this. Psalms 115, and in verse 7, no praise of God. Wow. Now that is a linchpin. What do you do with that scripture? There's no praise of God. So the psalm says in 115 and verse 17. So this brings us to a question. And it was actually mentioned in the, uh, in the prayer. And I'd like to turn there to uh, the book of Job for a moment. The book of Job. And in chapter 14. Because the question is... If indeed we're mortal, if indeed we are, for that matter, destructible, and we can be deactivated, and we can be extinguished, we can be erased, then where does the hope come in? Is there actually a message of hope in the Bible of the apostolic church? I'm not talking about the New Testament. Didn't exist. The Bible, let me remind all of us, of the apostolic first century church, that Bible was your Old Testament. That's what I submit to you. It was the only scriptures. That's why the New Testament is never quoted in the New Testament. <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about that. But the Old Testament is consistently quoted. There's no quotation of the New Testament in the New Testament. But the fact of it is, the Bible was the Old Testament at their time. And sure enough, over here in Job chapter 14, we find this. But a man dies, in verse 10, chapter 14, but a man dies and wastes away. Yea, a man gives up the ghost, which is basically a Hebrew word that means essentially breath. And where is he? As the waters fall from the sea and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not. My dad didn't rise up, nor did my mother. I saw her laying there. That's where they were. We closed the casket, buried them. They never got up thereafter. I'm in the same bondage as my loved ones. You're in the same bondage as your loved ones. We're all under the shadow of death. And at some point... That grim reaper is going to come knocking to each and every one of our doors. And we will, in fact, die. We will be deactivated. We will be potentially, potentially for the time, at, in a pause, in an environment whereby we cannot affect our life anymore. And he says here, uh, Rise not till the heavens be no more. This is verse 12. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their... Sleep. Interesting terminology. And here we see how Jesus would have gotten the notion of death being sleep as well. He says here, Job does, he continues on, Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me secret until your anger be passed, or your wrath, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Ah, okay. If a man die, and here's the question, is what we're talking about today. If a man die, shall he live again? That is the question that echoes down through history. 
And it's a very fundamental question that certainly deserves and begs an answer. And in this case, the Bible takes care of answering that for us. He says here, all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change. That's right, my change. And so here we, we understand that there is something, the Old Testament alluded to, that made it very clear to at least some of the writers, something was yet out ahead. Over in 2 Timothy, and I'd like to turn there for a moment, chapter 1, an interesting statement is made over here with regard to the objective of Jesus Christ's visitation and the definition, partially, of his mission. Jesus came to earth and visited us, became incarnate for a lot of reasons. But that does not dismiss nor marginalize what we're about to read here with Paul explaining to this young evangelist uh, what I want to share with you. In verse 9, chapter 1, 2 Timothy, we read, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? not according to our works, but according to our own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This was, this was all designed before the world began. He goes on, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. Wow. That's important to recognize. You need to park there for a minute. Let that resonate. One of Jesus' reasons for coming, for visiting us some 2,000 years ago in the fashion he did. Because he did visit prior to that, that's another story. But when he came on the mission he came as a human being, as described in Hebrews chapter 2, he came for the express reason, not only reason, but certainly part and parcel to the reasons and mission that he was on to destroy death. That's important to recognize. And it says right here that he came to abolish death and, look at this, has brought life and immortality to light through the good news or the gospel. Which essentially means here, brethren, what we're reading in all due respect to this is that what Jesus revealed in the illumination, the manifestation, the events of his life was how this immortality event works. How it comes to be. What is the methodology? How it is processed. In other words, you know, how do you make sausages? You know, you go to the factory, you eat sausages. When you go to a factory, you see how they're made. And the details on how things are made are important if indeed you're going to follow suit and make sausages. What Jesus did, brethren, is manifest to all of us and answer the question, how God is bringing immortality to humankind. And it's through a particular word that I want to introduce to all of us. It's called the resurrection. That's an important word. It's just not, it's just not a you know, uh, something to take lightly. The word resurrection has a definitive meaning, a very definitive meaning, that if everybody would understand it for what it means, would then understand that the notion of this fact that you and I are inherently immortal from birth, and that when we die, we don't die, we go on living disembodied, in another location, in another life form, would go by the wayside. But because of the misunderstanding of what the term resurrection means, people are befuddled. You hear ministers from Christian denominations talking about the resurrection and then talking about the guy wafting off to heaven at a funeral. You'll hear them talk in presentations and sermons like I'm giving here with respect to them wafting off to heaven or being tortured in hell and running around, you know, trying to avoid demons that are forever missioned uh, after them to kill them, torture them, and, and put them in pain, which is a lot of, frankly, nonsense. It's not there. It's not in the Old. It's not in the New Testament, these concepts. If you're looking to Scripture, now if you put this away and you look to church tradition, 
Now you got a problem because you're opening yourself up to the ideas that have been advanced down through history, as I've already mentioned, from different movements like the Hellenistic movement, like the Mithras of Rome, who adopted Plato and Socrates and Aristotle's teachings of you being inherently immortal, that we have this immortal spirit contained in our flesh, and upon death it's released. Even in the Eastern religions, they believe that your spirit then goes back into a different animal, in some cases a different species, reincarnation, and comes back depending on how well you did determines what species, I guess, you're going to come back at. And until you reach that karma, your spirit continues to get recycled over and over. And that all comes from this idea, this foundational idea that you and I are inherently immortal of which your Bible takes directly, head to head, to task. And you cannot deny it in that regard. Notice this over here in the book of Acts, because this idea of the resurrection of the dead was a very prominent centerpiece of the advancement of the gospel in the early years. Now, in chapter 24, I'll just set it up in the contextually, Paul is being accused of being a pestilent fellow. <laughs> and a ringleader of this group of the, that defined the way, and uh, they call it here in verse 5, the sect of the Nazarenes. And he is essentially under house arrest by the high priest and so forth, and is being accused publicly. Well, Paul finally gets the opportunity, verse 10, to answer for himself. And the governor, Felix, gives him the floor, and he happens then to stand up and essentially defend himself about the accusations of which he's being accused of. And he says in verse 14, I'm not going to go uh, into all the details of his defense, but I do want to focus on this, which is pertinent to our subject here. Verse 14, he says in chapter 24 of the book of Acts, But this I confess, Paul's talking, unto you that after, and he's talking to Felix, the way which they call heresy. You've got to understand something. The Sadduce Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. I've often said that's why they're sad, you see. But... <laughs> But the, but the reality of it is, there were people that did not believe in the resurrection. There were other Jews, and Hebrews, I'll say, because there were more than just Jews, other uh, Israelites from other tribes, the Jews are just one tribe, that believed in the immortality. So they got, they got pinched, they got hoodwinked into adopting some of the Hellenistic movement and essentially began to embrace and adopt some of these immortality of the soul kind of concepts. So Paul is, he's in this kind of framing, and he says, but this I confess, I'll go back now, start over, verse 14, unto you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written, this is interesting, in the law and the prophets. See that? There's the Old Testament. Paul's believing in the Old Testament. He's saying everything that he's teaching, everything that he's predicating his, his ministry on is basically able to be connected back to the law and the prophets. And he goes on here and he says, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Wow. So here Paul is in a, a defensive mode. He brings up the resurrection because the resurrection, this idea of being able to come back from the dead, and here's the difference. Here's the major difference that I want to emphasize here because it goes without saying we shouldn't marginalize this. Because if you take the immortality of the soul, concept, theology, idea, that when you die, you change life forms and you just go to a different location. You don't die. You're alive, disembodied. The resurrection implies, teaches, and essentially directly advances that you're alive and you're conscious, but here's the big difference. You're embodied. You're embodied. You're embodied in some kind of life form. And without that body of some type, you cannot retain consciousness. A living soul, based on your Bible's definition of a living soul, is a person, or in this case talking about human beings, who is both embodied, 
and conscious. And so this resurrection, the term resurrection, becomes very important. Follow me over here to 1 Corinthians 15 for a moment. Many have labeled this chapter the resurrection chapter, and for good reason. Paul is, is so focused on this in this segment of his book to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 15, that he actually presents it in a very unique fashion. And I've often had personally conversations with other Christians taking this tact and presenting this question that Paul states right here out of 1 Corinthians. Because you see, bottom line, at the end of the day, you can't have it both ways. You either believe when you die you waft to heaven or hell or purgatory <laughs> or a resurrection occurs and you come back to life in some kind of embodiment one way or the other. Because that's what your Bible teaches. He says here in verse 12, and this is the question that you can use certainly to pose. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, remember what Paul told Timothy that we read in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10? That what Christ did was manifest immortality. He manifested the methodology. He manifested the process. When they went into the tomb, there was no body. The body was gone. Why? Because the body was changed. <laughs> he was embodied. And he could reappear in a body as much as he wanted. Or disappear and be invisible. He could walk through walls. This is amazing stuff. You don't hear this in your conventional, traditional Christian church. The Bible is so different from in so many ways and in so many cases and especially in this question about what happens to you after you die. Here Paul says, if Christ, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, which he did, how come some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And what are they saying? I mean, if my loved one is in the grave and my dad's already in heaven, what is there a need for a resurrection? If my mom is already in heaven, or my uncles or somebody is in hell, not that my uncles were bad, but I'm just saying, the fact of it is, the fact of it is, what do they need a resurrection for? If I were in heaven after I die because I had an immortal soul and I'm up there already beyond the pearly gates, I walked past Peter, he checked my name off the clipboard, said, come on in, Bill, you made it, buddy. And I'm in there, and then all of a sudden, Jesus, because I heard, I heard a Christian minister say this, that they're going to take you back and restuff you back into a body upon Jesus' return. I would go screaming and kicking, I don't want to go. I've already made it. I'm in heaven. Why do you want me to go back to earth and be stuffed and re, re, um, re put in, reinserted into a body? I'm happy. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I heard serious ministers state this kind of theology of, like I call it, ricochet rabbit or ping pong. You know, they're off the walls. They're just saying anything and everything to make sense out of, here's the operative, out of their traditional denominational theology. Brethren, back here he says, and Paul does, rightly so, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen true. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also in vain. You know why Paul's saying that? He's saying it because he's not of the influence of Socrates. He's saying it because he's not of the influence, nor has he been hoodwinked by Plato or Aristotle, nor has he adopted the teachings of Athens or Alexandria in the Hellenistic movement. He's saying it because that's what he, under, he understands and knows that the writings, the law, and the prophets teach. Why do you think Nicodemus, a Pharisee of Pharisees, comes to Jesus by night, Nick by night, knocks on the door. Hey, Jesus, I want to talk to you, man. 
can you tell me a little bit more about what happens after, after you die? And Jesus said, come on in. That was a friendly conversation. That was a friendly conversation. And he goes and he proceeds to explain to Nicodemus the process. He called it born again. A lot of people think that that's an emotional Twitter patient of one's mind who comes to grips with Christ. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have to happen. That does have to happen. You have to come to your meet Jesus moment in your life and be motivated to change, of course. And I don't mean to di uh, di uh, disparage that uh, theology or even that thought, but John 3 is not about that. That's my point. John 3 is not about that. John 3 is about something that is much more far-reaching, much more beyond. It is metabolic. It is biology. It is changing this water into steam. A tadpole into a frog. Larva into a butterfly. So what is so hard about accepting the fact that humans are designed to be changed into something far more glorious, far more powerful, far more expanding? It's, brethren, the Bible is so chock full of a message that supersedes anything that most people understand in the Christian community. I know that sounds heady. Yet nevertheless, when you go back to the scriptures and you see this in living color, you can't come away with anything but if you are willing to open your mind and put everything to the side and take the scriptures for what they teach. Look what he says here. And if Christ be not risen, uh, our preaching is vain and your faith is also in vain. Yea, we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Jesus when he didn't. For if the dead don't rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, verse 17, your faith's in vain. Ye are yet in your sins and we're all doomed. But he goes on and he then, after playing the devil's advocate with himself, says this. Verse 23, he goes on, or verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now that's a, that's a concept there. He's, he's speaking in a, in a figure of speech, doesn't give a lot of detail, but he's just giving you two different associations. There is first the material, the common, the natural man, the fleshy version. And then in Christ, the second Adam, in Christ, you have life. This first Adam is doomed to death, in bondage to death. And if you don't do something about your condition, you're going to deactivate and be destroyed. That's the plain truth of what your Bible talks about. On the other hand, if Christ becomes a part of your life, and there's a process of that, then you will live. And that's what Paul's talking about. And he says here, in this particular case, he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Oh, okay. We have a process. Do -do 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 -do. Process. Process. Here it is. Every man in his own order. Let that resonate. Here it comes now. Christ, the first fruits. Here's the order. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Ah, has Jesus returned yet? So where are the dead? In the graves. They're dead. Or they're somewhere. If they were eaten up by a fish or vaporized in Hiroshima, and that's another story. The fact of it is, though, yet the bottom line is they're dead. They're deactivated for now. But there's a resurrection coming. There is a life opportunity coming. And in this particular case, as Paul points out here, uh, in this discussion uh, from 12 to 23, shows that there is indeed a process. Now, in John th uh, 3, 13, we're told very clearly, and I'm not going to turn there, no man has ascended to heaven. And we understand in the book of Psalms, the Old Testament, there's no praise of God. So that correlates. It balances. I've often told people when I've been on television to go ask your pastor. Take no praise of God, Psalms, and take John 3.13, no man's gone to heaven. And ask your pastor to correlate those two things. 
and ask him how can he confidently say the person that he just buried is up in heaven. The church member last week at the funeral. It's an interesting challenge for anybody when they talk in terms of what the Bible says compared to their denominational traditions. Because the long and short of it is the Bible does not square with many of the traditional Christian teachings that we find that are in the Christian church. In Hebrews, notice this, chapter 11, real quickly here. I won't spend a lot of time, I just want to make a point. The writer lists Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. Then in verse 13 he states, after he names all these people of faith, that all had good report, that you would think that if, they are, if there's anybody in heaven, these people are in heaven. But look what he says in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. So they haven't received eternal life yet. That's what it says. He goes on again. If that's not enough, 17, he repeats Abraham. He talks about Jacob and Joseph. And he brings up Moses, Rahab the harlot, David and Samson and other prophets uh, talking about how they were sawed asunder and so forth. Verse 39, he repeats what he states in verse 13. Notice again, he reiterates this fact. In other words, if we didn't get it the first time in verse 13, we should get it the second time in verse 39. And here's what he says, and these all, Moses, as I said, Rahab, uh, David, the prophets, these people, all, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith. I mean, David was a man after God's own heart, we're told, right? And yet you can read in Acts 2 that David is still in the grave. Acts 2, he's still in the grave. Has not been resurrected. Has not gone to heaven. Has not received the promise. And here in 39, it says, they received not the promises. Even though they attained a good report in faith, they died in faith, which means they died in righteousness. Because how do we acquire righteousness? In faith. Our faith is accounted to us, attributed to us as righteous, or for righteousness. These guys died in faith with good report, but they did not receive the promises. Back to 1 Corinthians 15 for a moment. And picking up, this, this gets so interesting in chapter 15, uh, as we uh, round third here and head home. Chapter 15 and verse 35, we read this. Some will say, how are the dead raised up? Now that's a pretty fundamental question. It's right in your Bible. It's simple. There's nothing complex about that. Don't ask, how does your life waft off to heaven? Or how do you upon death detach from your body? doesn't say that. It says how are the dead raised up? You know what happened when Jesus gave up his breath when he was on the stake? You remember the story that people actually came up out of the graves? They resurrected from the dead. Uncle Henry, Aunt Emma, you know, Uncle George and, and Aunt Julia and all them. They actually, who had been dead maybe for a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe, I don't know, two years. I don't know if there was a time limit on it that God said, well, I'll only raise up these guys because they haven't been dead that long. I don't know. All I know is the dead, when Jesus gave up and he said it was over and he gave up the breath and died, the, the curtain in the Holy of Holies split in two, remember that? And dead people got up out of their graves and went knocking on the door. Ah! You, you know? I mean, put yourself back in that time. Can you imagine if some loved one that you had all of a sudden shows up at your door knocking on the door? That's what happened. What is that all about? It's illustrative. It's illustrative of the process. It's illustrative of the process. The dead raise up embodied, embodied, not disembodied, embodied. You're not wafting off as some kind of spirit to become part of the eye in the sky. It's not there. What the Bible talks about is you're either embodied in flesh or as Jesus said, Nicodemus, what is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit, buddy. And Nicodemus' response, 
How can these things be? What are you telling me? He was incredulous. Read it there. Read the chapter there. In chapter 3 of the book of John. Jesus was talking about metabolic change. He's talking biology. He's not talking about Twitter patient and emotional change in somebody's mind. And again, not to disparage that or dismiss that. Because uh, we do have to come to that Jesus moment in our lives to become motivated. Certainly, without a doubt. But the fact of it is, John 3... It's not about that. John 3 is about how you become from a tadpole to a frog. Metaphorically. Metaphorically. You know what I'm saying? Metaphorically. From flesh to spirit. From that larva to a butterfly. That's how you do it. The Bible's clear on how it happens. And in this particular case, he says, the dead raise up, with what body do they come? I love this. Fool, that which was sowed, not quickened, except to die. And that which you sowest, you sowest not that body that shall be, but you bear grain. And then he goes, proceeds through, you know, you, you have a handful of grain, seeds, you don't know what they are, pear trees, apple trees, grapes, you know, Cabernets or Merlots, uh, Pinots, you, know, you don't know what kind of, what it is. You don't know what it is. You bury it, and guess what? After a few years, it comes up, oh, I got a pear tree, oh, I got a cherry tree, oh, I got bananas, you know, whatever it may be. But unless you're really a seedologist, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know your seeds, you can't tell until you bury them and they grow. And once they grow, and so what Paul's saying, this is all about bodies. Verse 40, celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. It's all about being embodied. It's all about having a body. It's about being some kind of consciousness, having that in a body. Yeah. Surprise. You're not going to become part of the eye in the sky. You're not going to become just some wandering spirit, disembodied and undefined, like smoke or a cloud. It doesn't work that way. Paul's talking about body. He gets so specific, he says, look at this now, verse 42. I, I, I'm incredulous sometimes in talking to, as a matter of fact, we're still thinking about doing this documentary on where are the dead, and in interviewing a Jewish rabbi and a, a Protestant minister and a Catholic priest and a, um, uh, a Muslim uh, cleric. Because here, especially for those that are in the Christian religion, Paul's very clear. Verse 42, here it is. He, right between the eyes. So also, is after he goes through this analogy of different bodies and celestial bodies and different glories of the moon and the flesh and so forth, and there's different flesh from men and animals and birds and fish, he finally comes down and he says here, okay, here's my point. So also, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural, fleshy body. When you're buried, you're buried as a fleshy body that has been deactivated. And you're in corruption at that point. You are corrupting already. It doesn't take long for the body to start corrupting once it loses its breath and everything stops. And so he's saying here, it's sown a natural body. Look at this! It's raised a spiritual body. And if that's not enough, there's a comma. He goes on and further elaborates and expands on the idea and states this. There is a natural body, and you and I all know that. Sometimes it aches and it pains. It sweats, you know. Sometimes we've got to fan ourselves, like me up here, sweating. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're fleshy. We're natural. And he says, look at this, and there is a spiritual body. Wow. And that goes right along the lines of what Nicodemus was told by Jesus. It goes right along the lines of what Jesus illustrated in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, where he came through walls, he disappeared and reappeared, he actually cooked fish on the shore, he told the disciples who were stark naked as a jaybird out there in the boat when they were fishing, and he came up on them in his 40-day ministry after he resurrected, and told them to put the nets on the other side of the boat, which they did, and they filled up with so many fish after they'd been fishing all night long and didn't catch anything that it almost broke their net. They brought it into the shore and were sneaking up on him because there he is cooking fish. He's cooking fish for them. 
And they're all wondering, hey, is that the Lord? They were as surprised, brethren, as anybody about what they were seeing. They couldn't hardly believe their eyes as well. They're probably going like this, trying to figure out if they were hallucinating or not. And therein lies part of the problem too. Because there were all kinds of stories, all kinds of stories from the body being stolen to him being drugged and he then woke up and disappeared and went off somewhere to another part of the world. Even uh, got the tombs mixed up. The Gnostics were running around claiming, hey, guess what? You can't even believe your eyes. What you saw was nothing more than a hologram. It was a hallucination. What Walt Disney's inventing now in Disney World with holograms and so forth and bringing dead people like Elvis and so forth back alive to where they're actually standing on the stage and you say, wow, there he is. Elvis is in the house, you know. That's what happened with Jesus. See, Jesus was just up there. It was just a hallucination. It was a big delusion. It was nothing more than uh, really just something that was not real. That's what the Gnostics were saying. Then there was a, even another one where Jesus had a twin brother. <laughs> that's, that's the other theory. He had a twin brother. And so it was nothing more than a scam. He didn't resurrect from the dead. And you have all this in the backdrop. All, you know, spinning. It's almost like, uh, you know, what we've got today with fake news. You can't believe anybody anymore. I don't care if it's on CNN or Fox. I don't care if it's even on the internet. And, and more so even on the internet because people make money on being able to draw you, your attention to whatever they want to say. And they could say the biggest lie. And guess what? You get drawn there to say, hey, that sounds interesting. I'll go over there. And then you've got a bunch of ads that get popped up. And guess what? They're making money on them ads. And we're all a bunch of fools for following them. But it adds to the mix of the day and age that we're living in because we're living in and surrounded by what? Lies and cheats, deception and so forth. All kinds of things. Whether it's politics, education, you name it, entertainment. It's all around us, brethren. Everything, in many cases, sadly, too much now is fake. Because guess what? Crime does pay. We see that in U.S. politics an awful lot, but that's another story. I digress. He goes on here, though. He says, look at this. How be it that which was first, which is spiritual, it's not that, but that which is natural, and then afterward that which is spiritual. He's talking about change. You first get born flesh, and then the spiritual rebirth occurs thereafter. He goes on, the first man of the earth, earthy, the second is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, this is verse 48, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, which we are doing now, we shall also bear, we shall, without a doubt, unquestionably, you will bear, you will bear, he says here, the image of the heavenly. And then he proceeds and says, now I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. So now Paul's going to uncover what's behind the curtain. And he proceeds and he says, We shall not all sleep. There's that characterization of death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. Remember? Christ the first fruits, them at his coming. We know by revelation, there are not ten trumpets, there's not two trumpets. How many trumpets? Seven trumpets. The last trump is the seventh. <laughs> it's not the tenth. There are no ten. The seventh. The seventh trump. The last trump, it shall, uh, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal. What, what do you do with that? If I were a Baptist minister, no offense on the Baptist religion, but if I were a Presbyterian, if I were a Pentecostal, what do I do with that? That just told me I'm mortal. I'm not immortal. I'm mortal. And until it says here, must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up. Why? Because immortals don't die. Jesus, 
came in the flesh so he could die. He could not die as the Word of God. He was God. He was at that time the Logos. He was not incarnate yet. Now he's back in his spirit form. And guess what? He cannot die. He's immortal. He's at the right hand of the Father, alive, waiting to get the green light to come back so that he can raise up those that are in the grave. And that certainly is a figure of speech. I get the point that people are swallowed up by fish and are vaporized and so forth and so on. But the bottom line is, the fact of it is, he's coming back to raise the dead and embody them in a spirit body. And that is the message of what happens to us after death. So what I'm saying is real simple. You need to repent of your sins. Those of you who have not need to repent of their sins. Embrace Jesus Christ as your Messiah and key to this resurrection, this term resurrection, this process called resurrection. Without Jesus, you cannot qualify for entering into the process. Just like making a vase, part of the process is adding water to that vase or the clay to make it into the fashion that is needed to be made into that whatever the Creator is making it. Well, the fact of it is, the water, symbolically being of God's Holy Spirit, is important for you in order to be malleable so that you can change and model your life after Jesus Christ. Get baptized. Model your life after Christ. And then, get ready. If you die before he returns, no sweat. Death has no claim on you anymore. So whether he comes back and finds you sleeping, meaning you're dead, not while you're conscious you're sleeping. If you're conscious and you're sleeping, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality of it is if you are legitimately sleeping, dead, <laughs> and you're in the grave, he will get you. He's got a file cabinet, a database that, believe me, would blow the socks off of any organization or intel community. He will not forget you, brother. We're told in John 5, and time's running out on me here, so I'm going to kind of sh shut it down here, but the reality of it is, is in John 5, and you can read it there at your leisure, states that he's coming back. He's been given the authority of having life over death, and when he comes back, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ are going to meet him in the air. Those which are alive, according to 1 Corinthians 15 right here, we just read it in the twinkling of an eye, boom, they're going to be changed, and they're going to turn into that butterfly. They're going to turn into the spirit being, an embodied spirit spirit being glorified, empowered by the family of being part of the family of God, landing with Christ. You can follow it there where the prophets tell us in Zechariah 14 on the Mount of Olives to reestablish the government of God on planet earth so that we, with Christ's leadership, can reinstitute the government of God and hopefully, God willing, bring peace to all humanity who will re, uh, cooperate and sub, uh, submit and concede to the leadership of Jesus Christ. Sadly, the Bible doesn't end with a very happy story for some because in Revelation chapter 20 does say that there will be lots of folks that just will not do that. Unfortunately for them, the Bible says, is not eternal torment, but what? Does your Bible say? Perishes. Destruction. Destroyed. So, the Bible is truly an amazing book. It really is an amazing book, brethren. I hope that this was somewhat helpful. Perhaps it did generate some questions. We'll have a, a question and answer uh, session uh, hereafter. Uh, when I sit down, we'll have some announcements, I think, and then I'll come back up here for any questions that you might have. But uh, do keep in mind, we're going to have a follow-up session as well uh, next Sabbath here. The pastor here, uh, Horane Smith, will be also conducting a presentation as a follow-up to what I 
kind of proposed here today from uh, from the Bible, and hopefully uh, many of you will return to to get some of the rest of the story, as they say. But uh, God willing, much of this information I hope was helpful to you, and if it generated some questions, hey, that's a start because the Bible does not the Bible does not uh, hide the truth about what happens to you after you die. It's pretty clear. It's very simple. You just go to sleep. You're okay. It's a place of safety. You experience death every time you sleep without dreams. That's death. And when you wake up, you can't hardly believe the time passed, right? It goes by so fast. Sometimes I wake up, it's 6 o'clock in the morning already, and I say, wow, where'd the night go? I just went to bed, you know. But the reality of it is, when you're not conscious, there is no time. Time has no bearing on you. So don't fear death. If you've got Jesus, if you've got Jesus, you don't have to fear death. If you don't, repent <laughs> of your sins and get right with God through Christ. Because guess what? If you don't have him, you need to fear death because you don't want to follow that path. It's a path of destruction and it's a path of wasted material and uh, certainly uh, potential that God truly would rather have uh, in his family sharing it with others. So hopefully we'll be back and answer some questions. Thank you.